share my screen here. Uh, this is my first uh, virtual kind of doing this sort of thing. I did uh, Allegheny Nature, Nature Pilgrimage two years ago, back when I still lived in New York. Um, and this is the first year, uh, now that I moved down to Virginia, that I could be a part of it again. And so even though, you know, we can't all be here in person, I'm very happy to at least be able to join in you guys this year. Um, so I like to move my hands around a lot and ask a lot of questions when presenting. So I might try to break for questions in the middle of this, uh, try to make this as engaging as possible. Um, but uh, in many ways, uh, the alternate title of this talk could be How to Herp or Herping 101. Um, this is kind of like when I was growing up, I desperately wanted to find frogs. I desperately wanted to find salamanders. And I really had nobody to teach me how to do it. And so I've, I've over the course of like going to school and getting in various jobs, I've kind of like gotten better at it. <laughs> and so this, for me, this talk is the talk that I as a kid would have loved to hear growing up so I could go out and catch more frogs. So I hope that after this talk, you know, even though we can't be in Allegheny State Park this year, that you guys can all go out and catch tons of cool stuff um, and take your families out and show them too. So how to think like a frog though, it's very interesting. So, you know, you might be on a nature walk one day and you might be walking around and you might find something like this. Uh, this is a abandoned quarry outside Washington, DC that I used to sample for one of my jobs. And it was humongous, absolutely humongous. I have a picture of me on top of the rocks in the background and you can barely make me out. Um, and you might think to yourself when you walk past it, like, oh my God, I bet frogs absolutely love this place. And you'd be right. They would probably chime back if they could talk like, yeah, we totally do. There's probably tons of frogs in a place like this. Um, and you would consider this like, like ideal frog habitat. Uh, and then you might, after a walk, you might drive home and you come to uh, a really muddy part of your road <laughs> and the water's like brown and orange and it looks really nasty. Um, but maybe you take like a walk around it uh, out of curiosity and all of a sudden you see all these toads everywhere. There's toad tadpoles um, and they're all croaking and mating and you're like, well, well, hold on. <laughs> why did why why did toads go here? Why why this mud pit? You know. And so, you might start putting on your naturalist hat and start thinking, okay, like, how are these places different? Is that big pond that I saw on my nature walk on the national park better for frogs than that muddy ditch I passed down the road? They seem to like both. And the answer is not always. In fact, any body of water. Uh, is going to have different attributes that make it better for certain types of frogs. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I hope that after this talk, you'll be convinced that that muddy patch of water is just as important as that beautiful pond we saw. So let's start with a really basic question. And that's why do frogs need water? And you might be thinking something like, well, frogs have really slimy skin. They don't really do well of drying out. That's totally true. That's definitely very true. But the, the big thing that reason why frogs need water is because of their eggs. And you think about a chicken egg, uh, it's got that hard shell. You can leave it in your fridge with no water on it. Obviously it's not gonna dry out on you. You can stay in there for a few months. Now think about frog eggs. Um, if anybody's ever seen them, they're like these this giant mass of jelly that you can like literally scoop up with your hands and it feels like you're holding jello in your hands and there's all these little small like literally like the cell like the egg cell and you can like if you have a little microscope you can actually watch the cells divide and it. it's super cool i love it um but unlike the chicken shell uh chicken egg it doesn't have a shell and if it's taken out of water in a few hours all those eggs will dry out and they'll die and so the big thing with frogs is that they need the water because that's where they're gonna lay their eggs, especially in New York, there's no, some frogs can do really cool things. Uh, like in Australia, there used to be a frog that would eat its tadpoles and raise its tadpoles in its stomach. We don't have that in New York. Uh, all of our frogs lay eggs. So again, they're confined to water. And now the second question I have 
uh, is kind of like a boxing match. You know, who would win a fight? In one corner, you have a bass. It weighs seven pounds. It's 24 inches long. It's carnivorous, has a voracious appetite. This thing is the king of the ponds. Nobody messes with it. And on the other corner, you have this guy who weighs 0.00001 pound. He's maybe two inches long. He eats algae mostly. And he grew legs like yesterday. He's really hasn't figured his place out in the world. Who would win the fight? And very obviously, I think everybody would choose that the giant bass is probably just going to eat this, this guy, this poor guy. And that's the key thing I want to hammer in is that frogs and fish don't mix very well. And so when you go out into the world and you're seeing all these bodies of water and you're seeing frogs being like a, one thing or another, you should be thinking to yourself, do I see fish living in this body of water? And so for example, uh, here's a few pictures I've taken in my work. Um, so like I said, on one end, we have the permanent water bodies like that abandoned quarry, always gonna have water. There's 100% gonna be fish in it. In fact, usually when I went out there, I think there was somebody with a fishing line trying to catch something. And then you got your seasonal uh, more kind of like you go out into the woods and you'll find bodies of water and they'll only be about maybe a foot deep at its deepest, maybe more depending on where you are. Um, and then you even get super small and you get what I call the glorified puddle, which is just like a puddle on the ground, <laughs> uh, not gonna hold water year round, obviously. And so fish, of course, are gonna be almost entirely in the permanent bodies of water. And whereas when you get down to those more flashy ponds like the puddles or the seasonal ponds i like to call them fish can't be there because they dry out and so all the fish would die fish can't survive outside water and so as you increase the permanency of the water you also increase the risks to the frogs of predation and competition and so frogs have spent thousands of years knowing this and so they've kind of adapted to various ways, depending on the bodies of water they like to live in. And so what you'll see is that the frogs that like the permanent bodies of water, and we'll talk about those, they have really cool anti-predator strategies. And on the other side of the spectrum, when you look at a puddle filled with toad tadpoles, those frogs are gonna be putting all of their stock into developing as fast as they can and getting out of the water before it dries out. So two different kind of strategies frogs look at to survive in the world. So now we'll go through each of the different types of pond. Uh, so let's talk about the permanent pond, you know, this, this big quarry. What would you actually find in a permanent pond like this? And so there's kind of two main groups. There's gonna be your bullfrogs and your green frogs, those really big, chunky guys, big as their fist. Their tadpoles are humongous. Their tadpoles can be as big as a golf ball. And then you'll have stuff like red spotted newts. And for those of you who know amphibians really, really well, there's something that ties both of these species together. I'll give you guys like five seconds to think about it. Like if you were in a pond and there's all these bass and fish threatening to eat your larvae and eggs, what is, what would you do? And so what these two species have done is they're both toxic. A bullfrog tadpole is actually toxic. You, a fish would eat it and it would get very sick. Same with the red spotted newts. Red spotted newts are very toxic to eat. Don't eat one. Um, and so they have also have this toxic larvae that can kind of survive in these ponds and not be bothered by fish because if a fish eats them, they, they die. And so that's kind of your permanent pond community is anything that can survive uh, with fish is going to have some really cool anti-predator strategies. And these are the ones in New York. As you get further uh, it's down south where there's a few more amphibian species, you have really cool things. Uh, one of my favorites is cricket frogs uh, that have a tail that uh, 
like distracts the fish so that the fish bite the tail and not the head and it can survive another day. So then we go from always wet to wet most of the year. And when you look at a, uh, something that, look, that fits that bill, you're gonna be in the forest and you know, really right in the middle of the forest, you'll just find an area of bare mud. And there might or might not be standing water depending on the type of year. Um, but that every year it gets inundated and that inundation creates kind of a bald spot in the understory. And those are what I call the seasonal ponds. And those are kind of like the capstone of diversity for amphibians because they don't have fish. And so a lot more species can say, okay, there's no fish here. I want to breed here. And so you'll find a lot of really cool species here, not least of which are my favorite species, which is the mole salamanders, like the Jefferson salamanders, the, the spotted salamanders. And here's when you get the bullfrogs too. Um, and I encourage, Everybody, if you haven't done it yet, um, if you have something like this near your house, if you go out in like the first rains of spring, uh, right when it starts getting warm and all the snow melts, for me it was always during like spring break, like that first week of April, you'll see all these mole salamanders and Jefferson salamanders literally moving in, laying eggs, and you'll see the wood frogs croaking it's super duper cool. And because it's so small, like these, these ponds are so small, it's really easy to watch them all do this. It's one of my favorite things to do every year. But because there's no fish, you have a higher level of diversity in these wetlands. Uh, you know, the, the species uh, in the permanent ponds, these guys take about, you know, a bullfrog tadpole could take two years to develop. So it's actually overwintering in these wetlands. Uh, whereas these guys are gonna develop in a few months. And then going further down the spectrum, we get to the puddle dwellers. And here's a puddle, that's a good example. Uh, what makes puddles like this form? It could just be literally a, a muddy ditch on the road. Um, I often find that on the edges of big streams where there's flooding, a big flooding event will happen and make these puddles happen too. So on the edges of streams, um, on the uh, kind of periphery is when you'll find a bunch of stuff. And these guys uh, also have a really cool community. Uh, I find that that's where you'll find most of your gray tree frogs will hatch. Um, gray tree frogs pretty much breed anywhere. I found gray tree frogs on the side of a highway and look like literally trash floating in the water. They don't really care. Uh, they've been, they colonize my friend's like fountain in his backyard. Um, you also get the American toads, which are really cool. And my favorite species uh, for amphibians, the spadefoot toads. And those are pretty rare in New York. They are there, but they're really rare. You really got to know where to find them. But they have this really cool strategy where it's like you have to go out right. Like It's like pouring rain. There's thunder and lightning. You're kind of fearing for your life. And you'll go out in these really, really like horrible conditions. And it's actually those horrible conditions that wake up the spadefoot toads. They'll burrow out of their burrows and they'll uh, go lay eggs. And their tadpoles too um, are, well, we'll get to that. So the big thing with this group is that unlike bullfrog tadpoles that take two years to develop or a spot salamander takes two to five months to develop, these guys are so fast developing you know, in four weeks, these guys can be out of the pool. And they've adapted to have cues, like if the water level drops, they'll start, uh, they'll start metamorphos metamorphosizing faster. And uh, with the toads as well, they have this really cool adaptation where if the pond is drying out, uh, some of the tadpoles actually become cannibals. And they'll start, they'll, instead of eating algae, which all tadpoles do, they'll change their entire mouth structure and start eating their brethren to survive. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a survival strategy they've adopted to survive in these puddles. And so you can see that, um, you know, each type of pond or puddle that you find actually has a very uh, specified amphibian community that is uh, associated with it. And so to think that all frogs really like ponds 
is not the case, you know. Some frogs really do like ponds. Green frogs love ponds, bullfrogs love ponds. But if you want to find a spadefoot toad, you're never going to find it in a pond. You'll probably never find a toad in a pond uh, because they just know that they're going to lay their eggs there and they're all going to get gobbled up. So they'll, you almost want to instead, when you're looking for frogs, look for that other stuff too. Um, as an honorable mention, because there are a lot more species of frogs in uh, New York than the ones I've listed, uh, there's kind of this uh, fourth group, um, which I had a really hard time placing. Um, I call them the semi-permanent group um, because they, they can colonize ponds, like the permanent ponds, but I've also found them in the seasonal wetlands. Um, I call them semi-permanent. Uh, for example, where I live now in Virginia, there's this pond called Pandathus Pond. And every year for like miles away, you can hear the spring peepers call. And uh, spring peepers do like to be in these permanent bodies of water, but you'll only find them in the parts of the pond that are a little bit more shallow, a little bit more weedy. Uh, that's where they like to lay their eggs because their tadpole is a little, a little bit more protected. Then you have your leopard frogs. There's a really beautiful guy I caught once. That's probably the only time I've ever had a frog stay still in my hand for me to take a picture. I'm very proud of that picture. Um, those guys have a really cool strategy too, where if they're in a permanent body of water, uh, they, can, they can actually spend two years growing as well. Or if they're in a more seasonal body of water, they can develop faster. So they're a little bit more generalist. They have these built-in cues into their body that let them know, okay, hey, this, this pond's going away. I got to develop faster. Or this pond is permanent. I can spend some time growing, uh, learning about life instead. Um, so kind of stepping away from that, um, I know I went through that a little bit fast. Um, feel free to start asking questions uh, about different bodies of water, how to catch frogs, how to find frogs, what frogs are in New York. Um, I'm, re I'm really happy to answer any questions. I really want people to get out there and start looking for stuff. Um, but going forward, um, I also want to talk about streams because when I was writing about all this pond stuff, I realized that streams as well kind of had the same dynamic going on. And uh, especially if you want to find salamanders, which are one of like my favorite animal. Um, if you know streams really well, um, that's going to really help you find different species of salamanders that are really, really cool. And so the first question I want to ask you folks uh, when we're talking about streams is which, are, which of these streams are more likely to have salamanders? On the left, we have a very big kind of river ecosystem. It's probably gonna be about 20 meters across, um, wet all the time. Uh, if I was fly yeah. fishing, this would be a perfect uh, place for me to go fishing. And on the right here, we have a very tiny stream. I could step over it if I wanted to. Um, so what, what what's your what's your natural instinct on which one is like more likely to have salamanders? To the right. Yes. yes. Definitely to the right. And the reason for that is two things. Um, there's not going to be a lot of fish and stuff like that. Again, amphibians and fish never mix, and there's going to be more microhabitats for salamanders. And now, what do we mean by the term microhabitat? I've drawn a very crude picture in this next slide. Uh, please forgive me, my artistic ability is not great. Um, but in these small streams, you'll have all these really cool microhabitats. Um, stuff like in the middle there, you see the leaf piles. You'll, like in the, in the streams that you go to that are really small, oftentimes a big branch will block it off and you'll see like tons of leaves get piled up behind it. Um, and salamanders absolutely love that sort of stuff, especially adult salamanders, because they want to stay wet, but they don't necessarily like to be in the stream itself. So like those big leaf piles that build up in the small streams like that, salamanders love that sort of stuff. Uh, in the small streams too, you often have piles of flat rocks and adult salamanders absolutely love those flat rocks and logs and stuff like that. And finally, uh, you'll, you'll have like kind of changes in the stream, whereas, you know, some parts of the stream are pretty flat and very shallow. 
uh, some parts of the stream are going to be very deep. Uh, and that's where a lot of salamander species like to lay their eggs as well. So you have all these different types of small habitats. When I say microhabitat, I mean it's like literally just like this pile of leaves is the habitat that occur in these small streams that you would not find in the big streams. And those are the habitats that you typically find salamanders in. And if I were to go out and search for salamanders, um, both in a professional sense, or just if I wanted to go show my friends some salamanders, I will look for this sort of stuff. I almost always find a salamander in a big leaf dam, like almost always. That's like my, that's my, that's my trick, if you will, to find salamanders in the wild is to go look for those leaf piles and just dig through them and try to find salamanders as well. So you're thinking about these really, really tiny streams. And actually a lot of these really tiny streams don't have names. They're not going to be any on any maps. And one of those reasons is because they, like the ponds we talked about earlier, do often dry out depending on the, the, the season. You know, in the middle of July, in the middle of August, it's going to be really hot, maybe not a lot of rain. A lot of sections of the stream will dry out. And so when I evaluate a stream to go out trying to find salamanders, I try to divide it by three main types or sections of the stream. You have your springs at the very, very top of the of the stream. Um, it'll look like a big kind of mud expanse of rock sticking out of it. And the big thing there is that springs are very, like, groundwater is very hard to get rid of. It's always going to be wet. And then right below that, you'll have a section of stream that's almost always wet throughout the year, unless it's a really, really droughty year. And then past that, you start getting sections of stream that are wet and sections that are dry. And like the ponds we talked about, how frogs prefer certain habitats, salamanders in New York prefer certain amounts of wetness because they're, they've adapted to them. And so if I was going out and I wanted to find, let's say, a red salamander or a spring salamander, I would almost always go to where the spring is, where it's always wet. And I'm sure you could guess why they're always there. Spring salamander larvae take six years to develop, six whole years of having gills, being in the water, can't be out of the water. It takes six years for spring salamanders to develop in a, in a stream. So you're never going to find them in any section of stream where it dries out because then their larvae die. Uh, spring salamanders too, their, almost their entire diet is eating other salamanders. So every other salamander is going to be like, I don't want to go anywhere near that guy. I'm going to go somewhere else where he's not there. And so as you go down the stream, you'll find in the usually wet sections, you'll find a lot of dusky salamanders. Their larvae take a few months to develop, uh, kind of, I'm sure akin to a spotted salamander, like two to five months. And then as you get to like the, the wet and dry sections of a stream, you'll see a lot of two line salamanders because those guys develop in like a month. Um, they're not super limited by uh, what the water's like there. They're more worried about the spring salamander upstream going to eat everybody. Okay, so just to kind of wrap things up, and I want to take a lot of time for questions. I'm happy to talk about this talk or just frogs or catching frogs in general. Um, but why does this matter? Um, it's really, really important to be aware that certain species of frogs like certain species of pond. For example, take these two wetlands for, uh, that I found in one of the forests I work in. Now, to me, I see that and I go, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Like there's going to be tons of really cool things there. Um, I can't wait to see what's in there. But, you know, if you're, if you, if you're not aware that frogs and salamanders actually prefer these really tiny kind of muddy areas where there's water sometimes, you wouldn't know that. And actually it reflects in our policy for conservation. So none of, no seasonal wetlands are federally protected. Um, no. Say again? Oh, uh, but no, no seasonally wetlands are federally protected. Uh, the, you, you're, you as a developer, you are free to just develop over these guys. Whereas 
permanent ponds usually have some sort of policy in place on the state or federal level that says, hey, if you want to drain this pond, you got to get a permit for that. And so all this great habitat for all these different species that are not green frogs are being bulldozed because they are not protected because we don't view them as wetlands because they're seasonal. And so what you'll often find is that because of our policy, people develop these wetlands that are very, very important for like spotted salamanders and stuff like that. And then you'll get something more akin of all these different types of species like spring peepers, wood frogs, spotted salamanders, Jefferson salamanders, you know, you might even have leopard frogs in there, but they'll be developed because they're not protected. And in its place, you'll find a lot of stuff like this, which are just kind of spring water, uh, spring water uh, retention ponds that people make. And, you know, you're essentially going from a community of all this diversity this beautiful pond with all these frogs to something more akin to this where there's just green frogs and bullfrogs because that's the stuff that they like. And so it's critically important to be aware that even if the pond dries out, that's a great thing and frogs like it because um, you just have really diverse communities and seeing these really diverse communities be consolidated to just small ponds of just green frogs is devastating. All right, so. Joe, can I ask a question here? Yes, go right uh, ahead. This is uh, kind of the end of my talk here. Oh, sir. Uh, is there any legislation in place right now that you know of that's trying to get the seasonal ponds protected? So um, I know Allegheny State Park is on the border of Pennsylvania and New York. I think that's a really good case study. So Pennsylvania uh, has taken a lot of measures to protect their, their seasonal wetlands. And so they do have some uh, permitting there and they do actually have an initiative to map out where they all occur. Whereas New York does not have that. If you go to New York stuff, it's just kind of like, we recognize this is important, but there's no policies in place, just be aware. And that's kind of the, the way it is there. On the federal level, um, not really. Um, there was just a Supreme Court case that determined that if a, a wetlands connected by groundwater, it can be protected, but I'm sure it's gonna take a few years to really suss out what that really means. <laughs> okay, thank you. Joe, we uh, have Paul in the chat asking, how does runoff from farmland with streams and ponds affect frog and salamander populations and development? Definitely, so, um, you know, farm ponds are, uh, like one of the more prominent wetlands out in the landscape, especially in New York or even down here in Virginia, uh, people make ponds and they'll have frogs. Um, the runoff is bad for a few reasons. Of course, it causes algae eutrophication and stuff like that. I don't think it's as important as saying having a healthy like buffer around it. Uh, so a buffer around it, one prevents runoff, right? If you have trees around your ponds, uh, at least in some sections, that prevents runoff, right? But it also, per, it also gives habitat to all the adult frogs. So frogs lay eggs, they, they'll hang out in the ponds for a little bit, but a lot of frogs, especially like wood frogs or salamanders, will like lay their eggs and then go back into the forest. And so having that buffer around it not only uh, prevents runoff, but it also allows the adults to have habitat for themselves after they lay their eggs. So that's also very, very important. Um, another big thing in New York that actually one of my students taught me this past uh, semester uh, in New York, especially is uh, salting the roads has a really detrimental effect to frogs, uh, putting down the salt on the roads to prevent ice uh, pretty much limits frogs abilities to develop. Yeah, so that's a great question. When bullfrogs overwinter, how do they survive if the pond gets totally frozen? Um, it's really cool actually to watch. Um, I, I saw this for the first time this past year, this past winter. If you go to a pond, um, there'll be a layer of ice, uh, but uh, usually those big ponds don't completely freeze over. And so you'll actually see like adult newts and tadpoles swimming under that, that ice layer. It's really cool and I didn't think that they could survive in that cold of water, but they're pretty resilient to cold water. 
Joe, I just want to back up for one second. We had someone in the chat a couple uh, lines up post that they have a salamander to show. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share their video. And I think that um, maybe if you un unshare your screen and then yeah, I can let me go ahead and do allow that. everyone to see it and they can show us uh, what they have. This is Jack and Taylor. They're twins. And they oh my gosh. Salamander. It's a little new guy. I love it. <laughs> so we don't know what kind it is. So that's a, yeah, so that's a, a red spotted newt. And uh, have you guys ever seen the really, really red and orange guys walking around? Yeah. yeah, the babies. Yeah, yeah. So those guys in a few years will become look just like that. So they go through like another metamorphosis. Oh, that's cool. And uh, if you want to know if he's male or female or not, uh, you flip him over and okay flip them over okay and you look at his legs and so males have these really beefy legs and their uh their like uh belly is like really swollen and and sometimes of the year they'll have what's called nuptial pads and so you'll actually see like these like almost like groves like black groves on his back legs i'm looking at that one I'm pretty sure that's a girl that looks like a female. That's what I was going to say. The, the legs aren't that stocky. Yeah, they're super stocky in the males because they obviously grab onto the females with them. Yeah. So they got him from Allegheny where we have a pond, a property, and they wanted to let you know that they'll be returning him tomorrow. Aww. He's a temporary <laughs> visitor. <laughs> No, but it's great. I used to, I used to grab frogs all the time and bless my mom's heart. I used to get these frogs and they would just start calling all night and you could hear them throughout the entire house and nobody could sleep. Uh, I think it's really fun to do that. I still do it. We have an inflatable pool and they um, modified the pool to make it a habitat for him. Oh, so that's, it's that's very really large. Cool. <laughs> that's really cool. And I think that's also an important thing to do, you know, even though, those really tiny ponds are not protected, you can go ahead and make it yourself. And if you make it and you have a forest near your house, I guarantee you in a few years, something will find it and start laying eggs in it. It's super yeah. cool to watch. Neat. Yes, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, guys. Um, we did have uh, some more questions come through in the chat. Joe, can you see the chat or do you want me to continue to relay them? I can see the chat now, now that I'm not sharing the screen. Okay. So I'll start with uh, Kathleen Schmidt. If I if I missed your question above, because I was uh, ranting about ponds earlier, uh, feel free to repost it. I'll go ahead and do it. Um, so Kathleen asked, we have a small pond at the end of the summer. We bring fish in for the winter. Um, is it okay to move frogs to the stream nearby? Um, so I, I would say, you know, kind of just let the frogs do their own thing in that case. Um, frogs, like, I see them when it's really, really hot. Frogs really like streams. Uh, they'll, they'll chill out in them, cool off because it's super hot. Uh, but they usually tend to avoid streams. And frogs are, especially the adult frogs, are usually pretty good about uh, avoiding the fish. It's more the eggs and larvae they're worried about, too. Uh, great find about the, the red spotted. Yeah, I love red spotted newts. I have uh, one of my favorite species. They're so cool. They're so cool. Um, Ruth asks, we have vernal ponds in the woods, but very few frogs. What can we do to encourage frogs? Do I have to transplant some eggs? And is there certain plants that can be planted around the frog to encourage frogs or increase their survival? Yeah, so I guess my, my first, the first thing I would evaluate if I was like, okay, there's vernal pools here, but I'm not finding stuff is um, I would make a really big effort to like visit it every few weeks, make sure there's nothing in it. Um, it could be that that pond just dries out too early. So you might think that it is wet for a long time, but actually what you're seeing is like it's wet. And then after a week or two of no rain, it dries out, then it's wet again. That's the big thing. Um, and the other thing to look at is what's, what, what's around me. If you're near a healthy forest, if you live next to Allegheny, for example, stuff is going to find them for sure. Like frogs are really, really good at finding new spots to colonize. But if you're, for example, living in like a sub more suburban neighborhood, there just might not be any frogs nearby that can find it. 
Um, so that's a, those are the two things I'll look at first, make sure it's wet all year. If you go out more, you might actually find out that frogs are using it. Um, they might be toads. They might just go in, go out really quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, look at the landscape too. And then if you were able to confirm that one, it's wet for a long time and two, um, that uh, there's nothing, like the landscape's good, but there's nothing finding it. Um, I, 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 I should have looked this up, but I wonder if there's any sort of vernal pool kind of group that, that helps people along in that process. I would encourage, um, if you can, not to try to transplant stuff on your own. Uh, there's a lot of risks with disease and stuff like that, that things don't like to be moved around a landscape too much. So trying to do it as, a, as, a, as good as you can, as naturally as you can, is always better as opposed to just trying to find stuff and putting it in it. Because some, it's also been proven that frogs and amphibians really don't do well when you move them. Like they really get stressed out by the process and they're like, oh my God, what's this new place? Where am I? Who am I? And then they'll get really stressed out. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so just, uh, you know, I would encourage you if to look at it for a year, see what's really happening with it. And then if it still looks like there's, you're like, why is there no frogs here? Um, look into maybe some sort of local nature group or conservatory group that might be able to help you that. So, um, oh, okay. So there, there are people who do stock bullfrog tadpoles and, um, you know, it's, it's, again, like, I just get really worried about using the stock stuff because I don't know where it's coming from. When you have a lot of frogs in close proximity, a disease from one frog could rub off on the other frog. And I just get really worried about that sort of stuff. I mean, the, it would be really bad if, for example, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard of that killer fungus out in the landscape. If, whatever bullfrog you bought had that fungus and then spread to the landscape around it, that'd be very bad. So I always encourage people to um, try to make it the process as natural as possible, let the frogs find it. And hopefully there's some sort of local nature group or conservatory that can do it as best a way as they can. I have a question. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, I've heard some of the news of, on some uh, algal blooms that are problematic in certain bodies of water. And that's happening a lot more, I guess, now. Um, and I'm wondering, well, could frogs be a solution to some of these dangerous algal blooms? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, I, I did some reading on that uh, earlier this year. Um, so, yeah, so the, the reason why we're having more algal blooms now is because it, it uh, our summers are getting hotter. And another thing to consider too, is a lot of these ponds don't have a really strong canopy cover. And so there's a lot more UV light going down, making really great conditions for ag algae to bloom, as well as what people talked about with the runoff from before, like all these nitrogen being put in and causing algal blooms as well. Um, I think that in terms of the ecosystems of ponds, frogs are some of the best algae eaters. Um, when, when frogs were uh, extinct in a lot of Costa Rica because of this fungus, they actually saw that the, the streams became completely smothered with algae because there was no more tadpoles eating the algae. So I think there's definitely uh, a really big effect that they have. And there's not a lot of animals that do that. Uh, dragonfly larvae, for example, don't eat algae. Um, and so I do think it's, 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 it's having effect. If it's having as big an effect to counteract the more sunlight and nitrogen, I'm not sure. We just confirmed the salamander is a girl. That's really cool. Uh, with the red spot newts, uh, if there's no more questions, with the red spot newts, they do something really cool. So we talked about how their larvae are toxic to fish, but their eggs aren't. And so what red spot newts will do to hide, they actually hide their eggs. And so they'll find plants in the pond with leaves and they'll actually crimp the leaves over their eggs so nobody can find them. It's really, really cool to watch. It's one of the, it's so cool. 
How long did the Springer salamanders live after the six year development phase? Yeah, so they, they live about 20 to 30 years. Wow. And <laughs> when uh, I've, I, I have a picture of one that's super old, but I think it's on my phone. So it'll take about 10 minutes for me to get it. Uh, they'll get more dark speckled as they get old. So I remember uh, I was in the middle of DC you know, you wouldn't think that DC has like a lot of really good habitat, but this one stream was pretty, was on a national park. It was pretty protected, but we were so close to the road that like literally like ambulance sirens, you could hear them. And we were searching at the top of the stream where we said like, you know, the spring is, and I flipped over a big rock and there was just like hot dog size spring sound, oh, like wow. humongous. <laughs> and it was dark cover with speckles and that guy was probably 20 years old uh, those guys live a very long time wow how long does the typical salamander live yeah so yeah yeah a lot most salamanders will live still a pretty long time uh i would say you know 10 years for oh, a lot of the species you'll yeah. find thank you what about frogs frogs don't live very long <laughs> um frogs you're probably looking at four to five years uh and whether it's because eventually they get eaten or, uh, you know, they get old, uh, it's hard to say because they, frogs, frogs play a game, you know, in ecology, you try to find the game that works best for you. So frogs game is I'm going to lay a ton of babies and we're going to have a lot of frogs and out of those frogs, 50 of them a year will survive to make eggs for the next clutch and so forth. So uh, frogs just kind of have this strategy of I'm just going to throw all my eggs into making more babies. And I might not live very long, but we're going to have a lot of frogs. Hmm. Yeah, I recommend ID sources. Um, I, I, when I was a student at Cornell, I actually wrote an entire field guide to the frogs and toads and salamanders of New York. Um, so if you go, if you search, uh, I, I can try to, find, try to find a link, but I think we're getting close on time here. I don't want to go over. But if you Google Cornell Herb Society, um, my guide is on the website. So that's, that's a really, that's a free resource. It has pictures. It has ways to tell apart different species. Um, and then if you want to graduate from that, because obviously that's me in undergrad, just doing a side project for fun. Um, there's the Peterson guide to frogs and toads. Um, and that's really good. Uh, and I recommend, that's what I use in the field now. When I go to some place I don't know, I usually take that with me. I was a couple minutes late, so pardon if I'm uh, asking something you already answered, but could you explain the difference again between fro frogs and toads? Yeah, well, so the, the term toad is one of those terms that like doesn't really like, it's not a very like scientific term. So for example, there's two toads in New York. There's your American toads and your spadefoot toads, and they're both called toads. But if you look at like a taxonomy of frogs, I'm doing all these hand gestures. I hope my roommate doesn't see me. Um, they're actually very far apart. Like they're not related at all, but they have all the characteristics of frogs or toads that you would expect. Their skin's really warty. Uh, they have those stubby legs and um, they, um, yeah. So then they also like, like dry land a lot. So uh, like in a general sense, warts and stubby legs means toads. But in a more scientific sense, you usually try to say, I'm looking at a Bufonidae means toad, and a Scaphiopodidae means a spadefoot toad. They still live in the same kind of ways, though? They still go through the stages, and they still need water for their tadpoles and so on? They do. In the, in the, in the, at the base the level, they both have tadpoles, they both lay eggs, but spadefoots are super duper cool. Um, toads you find throughout the year. I just saw, I was, was camping yesterday and I laid out a, a, a picnic mat and a toad jumped on it. They find them every year. Spadefoots are super hard to find, super rare. And the reason why they're called spadefoots is because they have literally like digging spades on their feet. And so whenever it's not a storm, they dig into the, into the ground and they hide there for up to like two years. They really just stay there. And so they're, so if you find a spade foot and uh, my ID guy goes over how to find a spade foot, but essentially you look to see if there's a poison gland behind the eye. And if there isn't, that's a spade foot. 
Um, that's a, a really cool find and you should tell somebody about it because people, we, we think that they're really, they're everywhere, but because they're so hard to find, we only know them from a few different places. Oh, hello. Hello, yes. I'm just following up on um, our small pond question. Um, when we winterize it and get the fish out at the end of the year, um, you know, we found out the first year frogs will not survive. You know, frogs come every year from anywhere. And so we get anywhere from three to 15 through the summer. And then so um, if when, when we're scooping the fish out and we've got the frogs there, do you just put them outside the pond somewhere? It seems like they'll just jump back in. So when you say winterize it, what does that mean? Do you like cover it with something? What is, what is that process um, like? Well, I, d I don't cover it. And that's why I was going to ask, should we then just cover it with netting or something to keep frogs from jumping back in? What makes you think that the frogs are not surviving through the winter? Do you, are you finding the... Well, when I, yeah, in the spring when I go to put the fish back in and I scoop out the, the, the leaves and dead branches that have you know, come from the giant trees above, um, I find dead frogs. Hmm. Interesting. My, my first reaction to that too is that they, they might not be dead. They might be kind of in the frog, sort of frog hibernation, so to speak. So like, for example, if I found a, a wood frog in the early spring and picked it up, I would be convinced that this thing is dead because uh, it just looks like a dead frog. It has um, no heartbeat, but that's actually what they do in the winters that they go into what's called torpor and they have no heartbeat. Um, they, uh, like they just look like literally dead frogs, but give them some time and warms up they'll they'll reopen up their organs and they'll start living like they literally come back to life it's really cool and so i almost think that that might be what you're seeing with the, the frogs um a, a dead frog it, it, if it's in the leaves that's that's what i think if you're seeing like literally frogs belly up in the water that's that's the, the, a dead frog and so okay. that would tell me that something's going on and if that's the case um it would probably be something about i don't know something in the water i would say or some sort of disease but okay. but as as a as for frogs just to survive the winter they they should be able to know how to do that on their own and i think that's how they do that okay i have a quick question yeah go right um, ahead so we bought a property in ellicottville and we have a you know like a big pond behind it so this will be our first winter having it is there anything wrong with just leaving it like doing nothing to it yeah you know it's I, I, it's you don't have to really think that like oh my like like i think the first step of any great like you know we, when we do this in science and we do this in conservation too like the first thing you need to figure out is like what's my base level here and so i rather would rather encourage you if you just got this pond or you just got this property just watch your ponds put some chairs out and just That's start what we listening. Do. <laughs> yeah, just start listening to the frogs and seeing if you can start. You know, there's a there's all these great resources for uh, frog calls. Um, another website I'll plug. Um, I know it's not in New York, but it's the same species. The Virginia Herb Society has a wonderful website with all the frog calls and all the ID stuff that you need. Yeah, cool. um, and just learn your frog calls, and then you'll start to know. Okay, here's the frogs I have. And if you want to go the route of like, well. I want other frogs, then you have to think about that. But like we talked they about- just leave, like whatever they wanna do, you know? Yeah, no, totally fine. And like we talked about too, you know, you might only get green frogs and bullfrogs, but that's what they like. They like the permanent water. Whereas you might have to do a lot of work to get something that's, you know, a wood frog or a salamander pond. And that might not be what you want. You know, you would you would probably not have to yeah. probably take out all the fish. So it's mostly totally just fun. for the kids to look at and learn about, you know, whatever wants to live there can live there. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I I definitely say pull up some chairs, learn your frog call, see if you can differentiate a green frog from green frogs have a really funny call. They sound like a loose banjo string. Um, I love that sound. Can um, you do it? Probably, what's up? <laughs> can you do it? Oh, okay. Bow. It's <laughs> it's kind of like that. Well, listen for it. Um, one more thing. Can you just say the web, the site that or the resource that you help create? Can you at Cornell? Can you say the name of that again? 
Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the Cornell Herpetological Society. Herpetology is a study of frogs and salamanders. And then um, uh, in that website, uh, it's been a little bit since I found it, there should be like a link to the Frog Guide of New York that I made. Perfect, thank you. But, All right, uh, Joe. Like, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. No, you're I, fine. I Keep about, going. I think I'm almost out of time, but uh, Laura looks like she put up a great resource for frog calls. Uh, and you can actually quiz yourself, which is super cool. Uh, like I said, too, Virginia Herb Society has a great resource for frogs. They obviously have different frogs uh, than us, but I think every frog in Virginia you can find in New York. So you should be good there. And salamanders, of course, don't make any noise, so you don't have to worry about them. Could you explain the physiology of torpor? Because it kind of blows my mind that something can be alive if it's not breathing and doesn't have any circulation. Yeah, so they actually, um, they have a compound in their blood that's very similar to antifreeze. And so they'll pump their organs all full of that so their organs don't freeze because freezing obviously would cause the cells to die. And then they just turn off everything. I think there's like a very faint heartbeat, but it, it is minute. Um, and all of their organs shut down. Uh, it's, a, it's an extremely cool process. The, the antifreeze is the key thing because their cells can't freeze. So they pump their blood full of this, this compound that makes it so they can't freeze. And uh, they just shut down all their other bodily functions. It works so well that wood frogs who are the best at it can survive in Alaska. Like they can, they can survive in like negative 40 because they're so full of antifreeze. So is there any cellular respiration going on during that time? Uh, probably a little bit, but it's very, very minute, uh, uh, just uh, enough for the, the cells to survive the winter. Wow. Thanks. All right. So I uh, think we're going to wrap it up there. Joe, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. I love your drawings. And uh, thank you to Sarah and family uh, for bringing us a real live uh, moving salamander for the talk. Um, everything is being recorded and shared to Facebook Live. So if you love Joe's talk and want to watch it again or share it with friends and family, uh, feel free to visit our Facebook page uh, and you'll find his video there. Um, we do have a couple more talks coming up this afternoon. Uh, we'll get rolling with digital wildlife photography at two. Uh, and then later we'll talk about uh, fungi uh, birding adventure and also attracting pollinators. Um, hopefully we'll uh, be able to see everyone in person next year, but uh, Joe, thanks so much for connecting with us virtually uh, from Virginia. Yeah, thank you guys. You guys are always a wonderful audience. Um, I'll go ahead and post that guide I was talking about on the Facebook live video feed of this. So if you can't find it, just look for my comment there um, and I'll have it there or I'll just pull up my computer. That'd All be right. great. All right, thanks, take guys. care everyone. Thank you.